A very warm welcome to everyone on behalf of the Center for Aviation and Space Laws at the West Bengal National University of Juridical Sciences here in Kolkata. Um, today we're gathered, obviously, for the workshop on peaceful uses of outer space. And um, as we can see, we have an exciting roster for you uh, of resource pe uh, persons who will be talking about the various issues with the peaceful uses of outer space. Now, quickly to move on with the conference, I will hand over the floor to um, Professor Shovik, sir, um, who is currently uh, an assistant professor of law at uh, NUJS and uh, is also the associate director for the Center for Aviation and Space Laws. He's also a member of the Global Forum for uh, Sustainable Market Actors or Responsible Trade and the network of, of Indian com competition experts, the cartel working group in particular. He's also associated with several leading national and international law journals in an editorial and reviewing capacity and has to date, to his credit, about 65 publications, including book chapters, constant papers and journal articles. Chavik, sir, over to you to introduce uh, the workshop. Thank you, Rohit. It, uh, very good afternoon to you all and good morning to uh, at least some of our participants. And uh, so it's uh, quite exciting to see uh, this kind of initiative uh, uh, when it's even more, I mean, it's even better than when it comes from uh, my own university. So this workshop on peaceful uses of outer space uh, is one of the initiatives that uh, has been uh, started by the Center for Aviation and Space Laws. And over the past uh, one year, uh, we have been, the center has been formed to you know, delve into the twin disciplines of both aviation and space laws and related policy measures. And uh, we are also trying to pursue active uh, collaborations with our other, other institutions, including education and research institutes, governmental and non-governmental organizations that regularly engage in specialized activities in these uh, spheres, regulatory activities and associated research. Of course, one of the primary objectives of the center is always to create a popular platform and forum for you know, exchange of scholarship and intellectual creative output of researchers and academicians working on similar ideas. And uh, to that end, we, are, uh, start, we have, we have uh, organized this workshop and uh, the peaceful use of outer space, of course, also, I mean, uh, the, the, the very topic is uh, uh, of considerable relevance in uh, the modern world because, as, uh, you know, the great rise and diversification of the use of outer space, it raises the question of what sort of limitations are there uh, with regard to space activities. And, of course, one of the more ultimate restrictions posed by space law is the use of outer space for peaceful purposes. Uh, so, you know, this uh, brings me... Uh, uh, back to the uh, very start of the space age, so to speak, uh, 1957, when and Henry Cabot Lodge, the U.S. administration's representative for the U.N., had made a very impassioned plea uh, that the outer space environment be used exclusively for peaceful purposes. Now, of course, uh, while uh, the Soviet Union and other uh, uh, nations rejected Lodge's overture, the speech uh, stands as an astonishing vision of uh, what outer space might have been. Now, oh, so many years after Lodge's proposal, today the idea that some of the states would seek to voluntarily limit itself to exclusively peaceful use of outer space seems quite uh, far-fetched. In fact, uh, U.S. itself has employed space-based force support technologies since even before the first uh, Gulf War. And uh, I think uh, recently in 2019, the Space Force has been created, a new military branch specifically devoted to outer space military and support operations. And yet, uh, questions and tensions concerning the use of space for peaceful purposes persist. And uh, peaceful use of outer space is, uh, you know, we get to see it uh, being cited frequently at the international level as a goal, if not an unwritten requirement of space activities. Is uh, Recently, again in 2019, I believe the UN General Assembly uh, approved the draft resolution for international cooperation in the peaceful use of outer space. So uh, this, of course, uh, I mean, together with the UN Charter, which uh, uh, talks about prohibition of use of force, or which applies to outer space, along with the different uh, other exceptions stipulated under general international law, and of course, the Outer Space Treaty, uh, which establishes a particular legal regime on celestial bodies, declaring them a demilitarized zone, banning the stationing of weapons of mass destruction in outer space, and so on and so forth. So any, like any other branch of public international law, space law is of an evolutive nature. So obviously, you know, future adjustments and developments of its legal normativity in light of the abrupt growth and multiplication of the exploration and uses in the space arena remains open. So to that end, we have uh, a fascinating group of, uh, of experts to 
uh, take you through his uh, uh, workshop today. Uh, we have with us uh, Professor Bruce Gagnon, who is the uh, coordinator of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. We have Professor Dave Webb, who is the convener of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. Uh, Dr. Aruna Kamila, uh, who is the associate professor at Galgosius University, and uh, Professor Shubrata Koshrai from uh, uh, the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, USA. And of course, our uh, very own Professor uh, Sandeep Abhat, who is a professor of law at NUJS and also the director of Center for Aviation and Space Laws, and uh, uh, without show who's active, if uh, you know, initiatives, all of these programs would probably not take place. So uh, without much ado, I, I uh, now turn the podium over to uh, Professor Bhatt uh, to deliver some opening remarks uh, for, the, for this workshop. Over to you, Sandeep, sir. Thank you. Can you just confirm whether my PPD is uh, visible? It is, sir. Not, yeah, it's starting, sir. Starting. Okay. okay. So, uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, a very good, mo good morning to all who are uh, watching from the United States and also good afternoon for those who are actually being part of this uh, event from uh, India or maybe from uh, Europe. Um, this particular workshop. The idea has come primarily from actually, I should say, the global network itself. Uh, as uh, Shovik has already mentioned, we have got actually very, very prominent uh, personalities from the global network against weapons and nuclear power in uh, the space. Uh, so they have got actually uh, a space for peace week. So this week has been declared as actually the space for peace week. I think so. Those of you who don't know about it, you can go through their website. Um, Professor, uh, sorry, uh, Bruce, Bruce Gagan has already actually shared, I think, the, the link for that in the chat box. You can go through it and you can get to know about their uh, activities more. Uh, so this program has been actually organized primarily under this uh, Space for Peace Week itself. When I basically approached uh, Bruce, he, uh, he not just uh, happily accepted the invitation to have this kind of a program, but he also actually coordinated with his uh, the colleagues and he could able to make this as a kind of a successful platform for a discourse on the uh, peaceful uses of the outer space uh, today. I should thank him as well as for uh, his team to uh, for accepting this uh, the invitation and being part of our discourse uh, in today's uh, workshop. Uh, now, before I uh, open up the, the floor for them to debate over the issues of peaceful users, I would like to just point out in the maybe the initial 10 minutes in my opening remarks, how exactly Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty, which is said to be the grand norm in terms of the peaceful users, is something grossly inadequate for the purpose of the peaceful uses of the outer space. To start with, as uh, Shavik has already mentioned, military activities in outer space has been a perennial concern. It's not something which is uh, arisen maybe in the 21st century or maybe in the later part of uh, later part of the 20th century. This has been a concern since the beginning of the space activities because both US and USSR, they basically invested in the space technology primarily for the purpose of getting a kind of a military advantage. Whatever may be the arguments regarding the scientific investigation or other things, the primary aim behind going for the space activities has been the militarization. And this was understood by the world community since the beginning itself. And that's why we can see that United Nations General Assembly has passed a series of resolutions on the peaceful use of the outer space. Not just that, if you look into the treaty making also, we have the five treaties in 1960s and 1970s, and primarily the two important on the aspect of militarization are being the Outer Space Treaty and the Moon Agreement 1979. But Moon Agreement has got the limitation in terms of only few states ratifying that, only 18 states being part of it, and that too, it is confined to the Moon and other celestial bodies. But whereas the outer space, uh, matter of outer space, when it comes up, 
What is important is the Outer Space Treaty in 1967, which has a provision in terms of the peaceful uses and also de-weaponization to a certain extent. Of course, there are many other provisions also, which in an indirect fashion speak about the peaceful uses, but the direct provision under the Outer Space Treaty has been Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty. For everyone's easy understanding, I have actually copied the text of the Outer Space Treaty, Article 4, in my slides. Uh, you can see there are two paragraphs. First paragraph you can see here. First paragraph reads like this. States parties to the treaty undertake not to place in orbit around the Earth any objects carrying nuclear weapons or any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction, install such weapons on celestial bodies, or station such weapons in outer space in any other manner. I should say that there are three major interpretational concerns in this paragraph. I'm just pointing out the interpretational concerns. I'm not telling that I accept this because to my understanding, uh, these are simply because of the faulty drafting of the treaty provision and nothing more than that. Three concerns. First, if we look carefully, it speaks only about nuclear weapons or any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction. What about conventional weapons? There is no explicit mention about the prohibition on conventional weapons. Maybe a weapon like a sword or a dragger or maybe a gun, if it is placed in the outer space or any other weapon, whatever comes to our mind. Does it violate Article 4 of the Outer Space Treaty? Going by the text, no. And which is, which is a great concern because estimates show that even a small piece of debris of one centimeter can completely paralyze a medium sized satellite. The velocity with which actually it moves in the outer space, it is capable of paralyzing a medium sized satellite of five to six tons. One can imagine how much of the havoc can be created in the outer space even by the conventional weapons. Forget about nuclear weapons or weapons of mass destruction. So this has opened up a question whether we should re redefine the weapon of mass destruction for outer space. So we understand the weapon of mass destruction in a distinct manner than what we understand on the earth. So that's one of the debatable questions. Probably I will keep it for discussion in the course of time in the today's workshop. Then second, I should say this is a misinterpretation, but still, the language has given a kind of a scope for it. Language used here in is nuclear weapons or any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction. It doesn't mention nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction. Nuclear weapons or any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction. One of the arguments which has been put forward is that when a nuclear weapon is only mass destructive in nature, that is prohibited in outer space. I just them generous interpretation, right? So one of the norms which we know in the, the law, right? So nuclear weapons or any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction. Argument is that drafters would not have used any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction. They should have simply said nuclear weapons and weapons of mass destruction. That's the kind of an argument, but again, it is not an acceptable argument because at the time when the outer space treaty was drafted, understanding was that all nuclear weapons are mass destructive in nature. That's why they basically use the term nuclear weapons or any other kinds of weapons of mass destruction. That was the basic understanding, but unfortunately, there is a, a misinterpretation which has been made by, especially from uh, some of the scholars in the United States. Then, another major point which I have highlighted, the, if you look into the, uh, the, the last portion, there is a prohibition on installing such weapons on celestial bodies. There cannot be installation of the weapons on celestial bodies. Interestingly, if you look into almost all other provisions of the Outer Space Treaty, they use the term moon and other celestial bodies. There is a reference to the moon separately in most other provisions. But whereas, here it speaks about prohibition on installing the weapons on celestial bodies. Now, going by the Vienna Convention on Law of the Treaties, Right, of course, moon is a celestial body, there is no doubt in terms of it. But since there is a two different expression used in different provisions, 
we have to go by the interpretation of the vclt we are not going to mention all the treaties which simply says that you can't give the same meaning to two different expressions so one of the arguments is that again there is no prohibition on installing the weapons on the moon i completely agree that this is an absurd, absurd absurd argument right it's an absurd argument but still whatever it may be uh, uh, there is an argument which has been made due to the fact that the drafters did not consistently use the expression moon and other celestial bodies throughout the space theory that's the problem and this is a problem which can be further illustrated in the next paragraph itself this is the second paragraph of article 4 right which starts with moon and other celestial bodies first paragraph only mentioned about prohibition on installation in the celestial bodies now it again comes back with the moon and other celestial bodies and let me just actually highlight four sentences of this paragraph separately what are the problems in the interpretation uh, in this second paragraph first sentence says that the moon and other celestial bodies shall be used by all state parties to the treaty exclusively for peaceful purposes first sentence of second paragraph two problems in the interpretation one how do we interpret peaceful purposes initially it has been interpreted as a non military every country believed that it is non military no military activities in outer space but unfortunately as the military reconnaissance satellite becomes feasible states have started to argue that what is uh, i mean the peaceful purposes is nothing but a non aggressive purposes if you want to use it for military fine but defensive not aggressive and even united states has gone to the extent of saying that self defense would not be effective if the if you completely prohibit all military activities in outer space that is why there is an argument that actually peaceful purposes need to be interpreted as a non aggressive purposes and not non military purposes i should say that this is a marked departure from what was the understanding in the beginning when the outer space treaty was entered into that's the first thing second problem again i have highlighted the first portion moon and other celestial bodies it mentions moon and other celestial bodies to be used exclusively for the peaceful purposes but where is the mention for outer space it doesn't mention outer space has to be used exclusively for the peaceful purposes provision misses it out right and what is explicitly not prohibited under the treaty provision presumption is that they are permissible that's what is the the, the interpretation which has been made so these are the two major problems in the interpretation of first sentence second sentence establishment of military bases installations and fortifications the testing of any type of weapons and the conduct of military maneuvers on celestial bodies shall be forbidden there is a prohibition on installations fortifications the testing of weapons and all but again unfortunately it mentions only about celestial bodies this is out both moon and outer space so testing especially is that testing anti satellite missile testing they are going to be conducted more frequently by saying that there is no prohibition under article 4 if you look into paragraph 1 which i discussed just before it only speaks about actually orbiting or maybe stationing the weapon that is prohibited in the paragraph 1 in outer space but testing comes under the second paragraph unfortunately it says only about prohibition in the celestial bodies doesn't mention about moon and the outer space again a problem in terms of interpretation the last two sentences mention that the use of military personnel for scientific research or for any other peaceful purposes shall not be prohibited then the use of any equipment or facility necessary for peaceful exploration of the moon and other celestial bodies shall also not be prohibited again the problem is in terms of interpreting peaceful purposes and scientific research peaceful purposes united states will say is non aggressive not non military so if the scientific research the so called scientific research is for a military advantage can any country use the military personnel or military equipment for carrying on that scientific research right so that kind of a problem has arisen in the interpretation of the last two sentences of second paragraph of article 4 so uh, article 4 is completely riddled with the problem 
in terms of interpretation and in order to rectify this there have been multiple proposals which have been made over the period of time starting with the venezuelan proposal for prohibiting all weapons in outer space then ussr proposing for the so called uh, say uh, international space inspectorate world space organization so different things have been proposed not just that there have also been proposal with respect to a separate treaty on prevention of arms race in outer space the paros prevention of arms race in outer space that has also been proposed over the period of time but unfortunately all those proposals are pending and un copus united nations committee on peaceful uses of the outer space which has been established primarily for the purpose of ensuring peaceful users since 1961 it could not come up with any kind of a solution concrete solution with respect to preventing a military race in outer space and i should say that currently we are in a much more dangerous scenario with respect to space militarization because during the cold war period at least it was a race between only us and ussr now what was bilateral during that time has become a kind of a multilateral issue with most of the developing countries joining the race we have also tested the asac china tested the anti satellite missiles right so japan uh, north korea so on and so forth so there is a kind of a spillover Uh, in the race for the military advantage in outer space so we this is the time for us to actually awaken from our slumber and take appropriate measures to ensure that outer space is used exclusively for the peaceful purposes and benefit goes to everyone thank you so much and i believe that actually today's discussion is going to uh, help us in at least actually mapping what are the major issues as well as actually uh, getting some responses from the best of the best scholars who are available in today's discussion thank you once again thank you so much sandeep sir moving on we have uh, professor bruce who shall um, who is one of the founding members of the global network against weapons and nuclear power in space when it was created in 1992 uh, he has also served as the coordinator of the organization since its creation he actually began working in uh, space space issues in 1982 during the ronald reagan uh, administration and uh, he is and we thank him for his service a vietnam era veteran of the us uh, usa air force and he began his career as a professional organizer with the united farm workers union in florida uh, at the moment he will be presenting uh, before everyone on the topic of space nuclear power the uses dangers and past accidents um i hand over the floor to uh, professor bruce to enlighten everyone thank you thank you can you uh see this is it, is yes. it appearing yes it's visible sir yes sir. okay well first of all i want to congratulate dr bod and the others who have put together this this workshop uh we from the global network are very grateful to you uh I think it uh, can't be said often enough uh, what an important moment we're living in as we try to prevent uh, the militarization, the weaponization and the nuclearization of space. So we uh, need your voices. Thank you very much. Uh Jane Nerana Rao from Nagpur passed away in June from covid he's the man standing behind the banner on the left one of our board members in the global network one of our greatest leaders and he has really been most responsible for bringing the space issue uh to india in a big way we he's worked for many many years to organize conferences in various communities various cities around india and also every year during our keep space for peace week rao and friends of his have organized uh, events speaking in schools and other places across the country so i would like at this moment to remember uh mr rao who was really uh, a wonderful wonderful friend and leader for us the 
real question that we face today is what kind of space will we have in the future? The U.S. Uh, has this slogan, Master of Space, uh, on, on one of their Space Command buildings in Colorado, in the state of Colorado. This is not the kind of future we can accept. It's important to remember the origins of the U.S. space program. During World War II, uh, Adolf Hitler in Germany had a rocket uh, team working inside of a mountain tunnel. That's the middle picture on the top called Middlework, where they brought in thousands, tens of thousands of Jews, gypsies, communists, French resistance fighters, uh, all different kinds of people as slaves to build the V1 and V2 rocket for the Nazis that they were firing against Paris and Brussels and London and other cities during the war. The scientist in charge of the operation is upper left, uh, Werner von Braun, and next to him is Major General Walter Dornberger, who is Hitler's liaison uh, to von Braun, making sure that he had everything he wanted, money, slaves, and everything else. Well, after the war, the United States had a program called Operation Paperclip, where they brought 1,500 of the top Nazi operatives and seeded them, put them into the U.S. space program. And von Braun and his rocket team were brought to the U.S. along with 100 copies of the V-2 rocket to create the U.S. space program. On the right, the picture of von Braun, some of his former Nazi scientists, along with a U.S. military officer. And they, again, created the U.S. space program. In 1997, the U.S. Space Command published this document called Vision for 2020, where they said that the United States would control space, dominate space, and deny other countries access to space that the United States would be the master of space. And they said by 2020, they would have space forces that would be in place to make sure they could deliver this vision. Well, it's interesting that in 2020, President Donald Trump created a new branch of the military, like the Marines or the Air Force or the Army or the Navy, a new branch called the Space Forces. Another <clears throat> planning document, this was commissioned, a study commissioned by the Congress of the United States back in 19, uh, late 80s, I think it was 89 or <clears throat> 88 or 89 that this book was published. And one of the key elements of this book was calling for nuclear power in space to provide power for weapons in space and for uh, uses on planetary bodies. In 1963, the United States created its first space nuclear reactor that they envisioned would power weapons in space. It, would, it was called NERVA. And then over the years, a series of nuclear devices have been prepared. This was the Cassini mission that was launched in 1997, carrying 72 pounds of plutonium-238 on board. But prior to this mission, in 1989 and 1990, NASA launched other plutonium-powered uh, space generators on missions to go into deep space. At that time, I was working for an organization called the Florida Coalition for Peace and Justice, and we organized an international campaign against all of those NASA plutonium launches, uh, Galileo, Ulysses in 89 and 90, and then in 1997, we uh, uh, launched a campaign called Cass against Cassini. 
Uh, this was from a news conference that we held in Washington, D.C. that was aired on national television, a channel called C-SPAN that covers government affairs. And people all over the world were working to help us stop Cassini. It was, in fact, after the Cassini was actually launched that we learned that the White House received more communications opposing Cassini than on any other issue in the history of the United States. Postcards came from throughout the UK and other parts of Europe. One of my favorite stories was in Australia uh, on the island of Tasmania, part of Australia. 1,000 faxes were received at the White House from the residents of Tasmania, Australia. And it was all over the uh, all over the world, people were contacting the White House saying, don't risk our lives by launching uh, Cassini. We learned that it's not just that there might be an accident upon launch that would be catastrophic, a release of plutonium carried by the winds, but we learned that, <clears throat> in fact, the fabrication process and Department of Energy laboratories, where they create the generators, the devices for these missions that are also dangerous. This particular article said that there were 244 cases of worker contamination as they were fabricating the plutonium devices for this particular mission. The Department of Energy has a long, dirty track record where water and air in local communities surrounding their laboratories are contaminated by these nuclear space devices. This book, Mining the Sky, talks about how uh, huge amounts of money can be made from mining the asteroids, comets, and planets in the future. This book was written by a NASA scientist some years ago. And today, this shirt on the right, this is a shirt sold by SpaceX, the company that is owned by Elon Musk, who proposes to occupy Mars and to uh, explode 10,000 nuclear weapons over the atmosphere of Mars in order to terraform Mars to make it green like the planet Earth, an insane idea, but these are the dangers that we currently face today. NASA is at this moment, <coughs> excuse me, at this very moment, NASA is planning to test nuclear rockets over our heads in lower Earth orbit in the coming years as they prepare to develop a nuclear rocket to get to Mars to cut in half the amount of time it takes to get to Mars. Just imagine an accident over our heads in lower Earth orbit with these nuclear reactors falling back to Earth and burning up on reentry. There are plans to have nuclear powered mining colonies on the moon and Mars. The nuclear industry views space as an exciting new market for their deadly toxic product. This is an example of some of the nuclear reactors they're planning on Mars. And the, uh, the uh, rovers driving around Mars today are powered with nuclear devices. Uh, these rovers are taking soil samples as they are looking for places where they might find resources like magnesium and cobalt and uranium on these various planetary bodies. Just this morning, I found this article, a, uh, one of the Department of Energy National Laboratories in the state of Idaho has been selected to help build this nuclear reactor for these uh, Mars uh, rocket engines. So this, pro this project is moving quickly ahead 
with very little public awareness and virtually no public debate about the dangers involved and the cost to the earth if there was an accident. It's not just a theoretical equation that there might be a space nuclear accident. In fact, there have been many over the years by the United States and the former Soviet Union or Russia. At the very top of the list is 1964 when a US military satellite with two pounds of plutonium-238 fell back to Earth, vaporizing in the atmosphere, spreading the deadly toxin worldwide. And one of the chief scientists for the uh, space industry uh, studied that particular accident and believes it's one of the reasons for the increase in cancers around the Earth since 1964. So when you have a series of accidents that release or potentially release uh, plutonium or uranium into the atmosphere, we're really asking for trouble. We're asking for big, big trouble here on the planet. And in spite of the treaties that Dr. Bott uh, outline the Outer Space Treaty and also the Moon Treaty that said that the planetary bodies are the province of all humankind. The United Nations very astutely trying to preempt any, any wars in space over control of the planetary bodies created these treaties, the Moon Treaty and the Outer Space Treaty. But in 2015, President Obama signed a law giving American corporations and American wealthy people the right, as he saw it, to go out and make land claims on the planetary bodies to begin mining operations. And so today we see very wealthy individuals moving out to try to take control of the planetary bodies, as again in the case of Elon Musk claiming that he wants to occupy Mars, Jeff Bezos pictured on the right, he owns Amazon, he owns the Washington Post, he wants to set up bases on the moon for resource extraction in the coming years. What gives him the right? Who gives him the right to claim that he can do so? And who gives the United States or China or any other country the right to claim that they can uh, have bases on the moon or any other planetary body? And right now we're seeing Elon Musk launching what could be more than 50,000, some people say even 80,000 satellites for 5G. They say they want to have a 5G satellite over everyone's head on the planet, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. But few people are talking about the military applications, the military use of 5G that would allow greater surveillance of the people on the planet and greater targeting of the people on the planet. Again, one more danger that we face from the militarization of space. Astronomers are deeply worried about all of these satellites orbiting the Earth, basically ruining the dark sky at night, making it virtually impossible for the astronomers to be able to study the dark sky as they've done for so many years. And another danger of all these launches that these uh, corporations are now creating because of the pollution coming from rocket e exhaust, where th these rockets are now punching a hole in the Earth's ozone layer, exacerbating, making worse the uh, climate crisis that we face today. So there's a direct link between 
rocket launches, space exploration, and climate crisis, something we need to be more aware of and more careful about. There needs to be more regulation about the launching of rockets into space. We can't just allow anybody that wants to launch millions and, excuse me, tens of thousands of rocket satellites into space. And because of all these launches, there's a need for more launch uh, sites, more space ports all over the world. And this is happening all the time. On the left in this picture is Rocket Lab in New Zealand. The people were promised that this uh, spaceport in New Zealand would only be for civilian launches. But Lockheed Martin Corporation has taken over ownership of this uh, spaceport and is only launching military satellites, military launches from this place. On the right, in the state of Alaska, is a Kodiak Island, another launch facility that the residents of Kodiak Island, a pristine nature preserve, uh, in the middle of it has been placed this rocket spaceport. They were told that it would only be for civilian purposes, but every launch from this place so far has been a military launch. And even Israel is, has tested military rockets from Kodiak Island, Alaska. It's now been announced that India will launch from Kodiak Island, which is famous for its bears and its salmon. So inside of this pristine nature preserve sits this rocket uh, launch facility that even India plans to use in the coming years. The people that live in this area are very angry and upset about this spaceport in their community. You might know about this test of an anti-satellite weapon by India in 2019. And uh, uh, it's, it's just an example of the dangers that we now face as the United States and uh, Russia and China, India now have tested these anti-satellite weapons. We know that when you blow up a satellite in space, it creates more space debris or space junk, which is increasingly becoming a problem. There is so much space debris orbiting the Earth today that scientists fear that at some point in time there's going to be a cascading collision of this space debris with existing satellites and even the International Space Station. And they fear that when this happens, there will be so much of this debris that life on Earth will go dark. Think of it. Today, much of what we do on Earth is using space technology. This, this workshop is using space technology. Uh, it's using satellite technology, your cell phones, cable TV, weather prediction, internet banking, air traffic control. Uh, so many things we do today are, are using space satellites. If we continue to allow this destruction of, of objects in space, soon the planet will go dark. And scientists say we will be entombed to the planet. We will not be able to get a rocket through this minefield orbiting the Earth. So we must begin to view space in a new way. Space is an environment that needs to be protected. And we're not doing a very good job of it at this time. So please help us uh, think of space in a sacred way. We've long been connected uh, to the night sky on this planet for tens of thousands of years. People have wondered about what the heavens were all about. Who is God? Where does God come from? Where does life come from? This is a sacred, sacred place that space is. 
and we must be, help the people of the planet think uh, in a new way about how we view space and how we utilize space. Thank you so much for being a part of this workshop, and we hope that you will help us free the sky from nuclear weapons, from space weapons. Let's keep space for peace. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. Um, that was extremely enlightening. Um, I would also like to mention that anyone who has any questions specifically for a resource person, please uh, put them down in the chat box and we shall discuss them right after the presentations. Um, sort of picking up where uh, Professor Bruce, Bruce left off, I believe uh, Professor, Professor Dave Webb will now talk about emerging technologies and the environment and specifically how they affect um, the environment uh, that uh, Sir Bruce had obviously um, laid out in his presentation. Professor D Dave in particular is the convener of the Global Network Against Weapons and Nuclear Power in Space. He is a retired university engineer prof engineering professor who switched to peace and conflict studies and um, currently he is also the chair of the campaign for nuclear disarmament in the UK, the vice president of the International Peace Bureau and a patron of the UK Group for Scientists for Global Responsibility. I shall uh, yield the floor to Professor Dave to enlighten us about the emerging technologies and the manner in which they affect the space environment and the environment on Earth as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for um, inviting me to, uh, to join this important um, conference. Uh, I hope you can see the slide here. This is yes, the... Okay. Um, okay, good. So thank you, yes, and I'm going to repeat some of what Bruce has already said, actually, but uh, I think it's worth repeating because it's extremely important. So we've already heard about the Outer Space Treaty, and the Outer Space Treaty was proposed to preserve the space environment uh, as pristine as possible. But uh, with the rapid growth of the space industry, problems are arising for the environment on Earth and these problems are going to escalate in the near future. Um, the space budgets of the main spacefaring nations gives a clue as to where the push for space is coming from. Uh, the US, you can see here, the US, China, Russia, France and India are the major spacefarers of the world and a sizable slice of those budgets involves supporting the further militarization of space. The number of space forces around the world is, is also growing, and so are their budgets as well. And in 2020, the total global annual expenditure for um, military space was over $28 billion. That's a considerable amount of money. But the use of satellites has expanded rapidly in all sorts of areas of our everyday lives, as Bruce has already said. Uh, and space is now an integral part of communications, broadcasting, and many other applications. Space big, is big business, with some forecasters suggesting it could be worth over a trillion dollars by 2040. Morgan Stanley estimates that the global space industry could generate considerable revenues in the near future, and you can see here where the money is being spent. The major category you can see, these are the years along here, and this is the amount of money uh, going up uh, on the vertical axis. The light green category is referred to as second order impacts, and that represents the growth expected in a world where everyone is connected to the internet. So the most significant short and medium term financial opportunities may come from satellite broadband internet access. And in addition, many of the commercial launches also have military applications, of course, and these kind of so-called dual-use programs are sometimes difficult to differentiate the military from the commercial parts. In addition, the number of space launches is also increasing. And as we can see here in this graph, the green part of the um, of the graph is the majority 
of launches which are coming from private industry at the moment. In the past it's been military, now the, the uh, private industry is taking over with the number of launches. There's growing competition in this area and space companies are now interested in building networks of mini satellites launched into low earth orbit or LEO to provide global internet services. Older satellite systems rely on bigger satellites that orbit higher up in geostationary orbits. But companies such as SpaceX and OneWeb are planning to provide much faster communications from lower orbits. Low Earth orbits uh, satellites at a height of the, the sorry low low Earth orbit satellites orbit at a height of 200 to 2,000 kilometers from the ground with an orbital period which ranges from 90 minutes to two hours. Their low altitudes mean that they have high velocities and they can make some 12 to 16 turns of the Earth every day. This also means, however, that they're only visible to a particular observer on the ground for a short time. One specific orbit, a polar orbit, is inclined at 90 degrees to the equatorial plane co and covers both poles. This orbit is fixed in space and the Earth rotates underneath and so one satellite can in principle provide coverage to the entire globe although there are long periods during which the satellite is out of view of any one specific ground station. This kind of orbit is often used for monitoring and surveillance purposes by either um, commercial or scientific exploits or military as well. The satellites store the information that they collect and then they download it when they approach a receiving station. For commercial purposes though, large numbers of network satellites are required to give a continuous global coverage. The military also often use <coughs> commercial companies for launching satellites and this increase in the use of LEO is also leading to an increase in launch facilities and launch providers and the launching satellites of uh, and the launching of satellites into LEO is becoming very competitive resulting in lower costs as we can see from this graph here the costs are for uh, this is a, a graph that shows the the, the, uh, the the cost of per kilogram of cargo uh, from particular principal launch vehicles and as you can see the SpaceX Falcon 9 is particularly competitive um, it, it's one of the cheapest ways of launching um, things into space satellites or whatever however as the number of launches increases the effect on the environment also increases and one concern is the effect of rocket exhausts Exhausts depend on the, the type of exhaust depends on the fuel being used and many rockets use a mixture of kerosene and liquid oxygen while others use liquid hydrogen or some other more complex compounds. In 2005 there were reports that levels of perchlorate in breast milk and vegetables were high in many areas near launch sites. Perchlorates occur naturally but indications were that rockets were contaminating water supplies and perchlorate has been linked to thyroid ailments and is considered particularly dangerous to children. Rocket engine exhausts also contain gases and particles that can affect Earth's climate and the stratospheric ozone layer that protects us from the ultraviolet rays from the sun as Bruce has already mentioned. In the past, <coughs> rocket launches have been assumed to be not too much of a threat to the global environment because the space industry was small and unchanging. However, now today's rapid growth and the lack of research and oversight is causing some concerns among scientists and citizen groups. Let's consider some of the different types of rocket propellants. Shuttle launches of the past and the Apollo era Saturn V vehicles use liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen which produce water vapor which is the biggest contributor to the natural greenhouse effect 
And although it may have little effect at ground level, at high altitudes the, the effects are very large. Water vapour emissions can impact the mesosphere and the ionosphere. And you can see here, this is a, just a diagram showing the different um, uh, sections of the, of the Earth's atmosphere as you go from the Earth's surface. Um, so here, this, the line called the Kármán line there is the line that differentiates what we would call um, uh, near Earth space from outer space. So at 100 kilometers is where astronautics rather than aeronautics is, is an important um, feature. Uh, and the, the areas of the atmosphere that we're talking about are the thermosphere, the mesosphere, the stratosphere in particular. The stratosphere contains the ozone layer um, that we've been talking about. So, <clears throat> um, so water vapour emissions can impact the mesosphere and ionosphere and high altitude cloud blooms attributed to specific launches have been frequently observed. Transient dropouts in electron content and have also been observed in expanding ionospheric plumes mainly from their impact on, on space-based navigation signals. In addition, the very high carbon emissions associated with liquid hydrogen come from the very energy-intensive processes needed to create and store the fuel at extremely low temperatures before it's used. And it's been estimated that for each tonne of liquid hydrogen used, about 25 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalent is emitted. This compares with about three tons of carbon dioxide equivalent for aviation fuel. It's also estimated that the launch of Blue Horizons New Shepard spacecraft is responsible for something like 330 tons of carbon dioxide equivalent being released. Currently, the global quantities of these gas emissions from rockets are much less than atmospheric inputs from other sources. But the question is, for how long? Other rockets that use kerosene, as in SpaceX's Falcon 9 and Russia's Soyuz rockets, produce alumina and black soot or black carbon particles in the stratosphere. Rocket engines emit large amounts of black carbon compared to a modern jet engine. During flight through the stratosphere, black carbon can account for several percent of the rocket emissions but it's only about 1% of the emissions from modern jet engines. In 2018, rockets emitted more than 225 tonnes of black carbon particles into the stratosphere, comparable to the annual amount of black carbon emitted by global aviation. Meanwhile, solid fuel rockets have emitted over 1,400 tonnes of alumina particles into the stratosphere. Black carbon has been found to play an important role in global warming. Rocket launch particles are ending up in the stratosphere, a region important for weather. And because they're so small, they stay there for some three to four years and, and slowly build up. Black carbon and alumina particles reduce the intensity of the solar flux on the top of the atmosphere and so contribute to the cooling of the Earth's lower atmosphere and surface. However, it's been shown that the Earth responds to rocket particle injections in very complex ways. Unraveling this complexity and accurately assessing the potential effects of the coming surge in rocket emissions will require sophisticated computer modeling, which has yet to be performed. As we've seen, the annual number of rocket launches is due to grow fast and smaller satellites are becoming cheaper to launch. Also, commercial entities like SpaceX and Blue Origin are eyeing space tourism, the Moon, and possibly Mars. And all, miss, all this means that there will be a continuing increase in launches and in launch sites. And in particular, the recent ventures into space tourism by billionaire entrepreneurs does not bode well especially if this activity is extended to become more affordable and more available. Obviously, the best time to deal with a problem 
is when it's still small and manageable. And this is especially true in space where problems can linger for a very long time. For example, uh, as again, Bruce has already mentioned, the problem of orbital debris has been observed, but not really considered seriously until quite recently. The buildup of debris in space has been growing since the dawn of the space age. It's grown so much that in 1978, NASA scientist Donald J. Kessler proposed a situation where two colliding objects in space could generate more debris that then collides with other objects, creating even more. This has become known as the Kessler syndrome and such a self-sustaining cascade of collisions of space debris in low Earth orbit could eventually result in a cloud of debris traveling at 36,000 kilometers per hour, so dense that rockets may not be able to pre pre penetrate it. Again, as Bruce has already mentioned. The European Space Agency estimates that there are roughly 166 million man-made objects in space, ranging in size from one millimeter to the size of a refrigerator. And although there are around 2,000 active satellites in orbit, there are also 3,000 inactive ones. As launch numbers rise and as tens of thousands of satellites with a limited lifetime are placed in low Earth orbit, the problem will increase significantly. And a more recent problem presented by placing so many satellites in orbit is the threat to the night sky, which is due to be scarred by the trails of satellites as they pass overhead. As Bruce mentioned, astronomers investigating very distant objects need to take very long exposure photographs of the sky, and these are already being photobombed by satellites in low Earth orbit. And finally, uh, there are two other threats to the environment from launch accidents and the construction of new space ports. Accidents at launch cause a considerable amount of environmental destruction and contamination. The increase in satellite launches is accompanied by an increase in places to launch from, and the response of Elon Musk is to shrug his shoulders and to keep trying until it works. However, an accident at the launch site on Cody, Kodiak Island in Alaska that Bruce mentioned in 2014 resulted in such heavy damage that the site was not reopened for two years. And the new push for the use of nuclear power in space creates the possibility of a launch accident spreading deadly nuclear materials over an extremely large area. There's also an increase in the number of new spaceports being established around the world as more and more governments and businesses see opportunities in cashing in on the new space gold rush. The construction of these spaceports is often opposed by local residents who are concerned about the effects on their environment and the destruction of local ecologies. But their arguments are usually drowned out by the promises of jobs and prosperity from the income that might arise through the uh, spaceports themselves. So how do we deal with these growing problems? Obviously, much more research is needed into the environmental effects of rocket launches. <clears throat> and the, the, there needs to be some international agreement on limiting the number of launches. Joyriding and space tourism does not really seem to be a very good reason to pollute the space and Earth environment. At one of the global network conferences um, on space use and ethics, which was held in Darmstadt, Germany in 1999, the mathematician and physicist Jürgen Schäferen, now a professor at the University of Hamburg, spoke on the peaceful and sustainable use of space and developed a set of criteria for assessing the use of space technology to ensure its societal acceptance and its costs and its resources, goals and benefits. These are the criteria he suggested, eight of them, for the assessment of future space projects, which can also be applied to other fields of technology. I think these are really worth considering and thinking about in much more detail than we perhaps have today, but I'll leave them here 
uh, uh, these very suggestive, uh, very sensible suggestions on the screen for you to consider, and we could maybe discuss these later. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the for that information, sir. Now we shall invite uh, Dr. Aruna Kamila who is an associate professor with a demonstrated history of working with the legal services industry. She is, in fact, has a lot of experience in space law, including um, other fields such as cyber law, public international law, maritime law, etc., and is currently an associate professor at the School of Law in Golgotia's University, Greater Noida, Uttar Pradesh, India. She is also the chair of the LLM program at the university and is the head for the postgraduate legal studies. And in fact, she is in charge of the Center for International Law and uh, for Research in International Law and the Law Journal uh, in the university. Uh, in fact, I would also like to mention that she has about 20 years of academic and industrial experience, both in India and abroad. And before us, everyone today, she shall be speaking on the topic demilitarization of outer space and the plausibility for the same. I yield the floor to ma'am um, for enlightening information. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rohit, uh, for a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Sandeepa, sir, for giving me this opportunity. And I'm really glad uh, to be a member of Global Network, uh, without which I wouldn't be here. So thanks to all of you and also to the participants here uh, listening to this uh, work workshop today. Uh, so uh, coming to my topic, that is demilitarization of outer space and the plausibility. So, we all know that the space which we knew as the province of all mankind, the use of which shall be for peaceful purposes and carried out for the benefit and interest of all countries, has been diluted of late to a large extent. And in fact, we could witness this from the attitude of the states that traveled from the agreement uh, to peaceful use of space to a dedicated space command. So the space has been used for deployment of satellites, of course, which are very much uh, aiding us in the communication, broadcasting, navigation, disaster management, meteorological forecast, and also these benefits uh, which have been reaped by almost every country on this planet. And these satellites have also aided in the remote sensing, surveillance, aerial photography, scientific experimentation, and this particular satellites, they have a dual use and nature as these activities are also exploited for military purposes. So this militarization and weaponization of the space, so apart from being ancillary to technological developments, can be actually attributed to the political military events that have unfolded in the past three or even four decades, we can say, wherein the world has witnessed a a paradigm shift in the matters of security. So the factors such as loss of power by USSR, the rise of fundamentalism, terrorism, these have actually raised menacing threats to global peace and security. And the nations felt that there is an urgent need to equip and arm their security forces for ever-changing warfares as well, uh, which are like various warfares that are taking place there because of this technological advancement. And one is this, and also we can include the cyber warfare and many other warfares we can even discuss about. So in the light of the growth in the economic power, the nations felt that it is very much important for them to project their respective powers, that is technical, be technical, economic, or even military to consolidate the balance of the power in the new world order. So the projection and manifestation of the military might in the light of the technological advancement, not restricted to land and sea and the superpowers especially are consistently trying to dominate the outer space by even weaponizing and militarizing the outer space. In fact, this militarizing of space has happened or taken place long ago, which I would be addressing that aspect as well. So this uh, use of outer space to fight wars is not a new concept. Rockets reaching high into the atmosphere has been in discussion since Second World War. The investments made by the Nazis towards development of such rockets are well known to everyone. And even in the 1960s, earlier USSR had an orbital weapon called a killer satellite that was developed to approach the space target using the guidance of 
radar and then explode shrapnel warheads to Calais. So however, this project failed due to problems in the guidance system. And the USSR also secretly tested during the late 1960s an orbital weapon known as fractional orbit bombardment system, which was to, in short, it was called as a FOBS as well, and which was to be used to place hydrogen bomb in low Earth orbit for quickly launching an attack against the ground target. So, however, this FOBS were prohibited by virtue of the strategic arms limitation talks that is in SAL II agreement of 1979, which prohibited the deployment of FOBS systems. And during the period of Cold War, there were several reports of US spy satellites being blinded by the anti-satellite lasers developed by the USSR. And the USSR also used MiG-31 as an uh, anti-satellite launch platform. And the US in 1985 successfully actually targeted a satellite orbiting at 555 kilometers by carrying AGM-69 on a modified F-15 Eagle plane. And US during 1980s, this has actually extensively engaged in the weaponization of the space through its strategic defense initiative, also known as Star Wars. And I think many times Bruce was addressing this particular aspect in our earlier uh, talks many times. So this Star Wars program initiated by then President Ronald Reagan. The idea behind the program was to put satellites into the space that were capable of detecting the enemy missiles that were launched and then shoot them down. So these space-based anti-missiles were developed not as a substitute of the ground defense, but as a part of multi-defense strategy that would strengthen the ground defense. And the ground defenses also included the sea-based interceptors that were carried by the ships as well as ground-based terminal high altitude defense area, and which were designed with the objective of engaging short and medium range missiles. And in particular, this use of space technologies was extensively seen during the Gulf War in 1991 and also NATO intervention in Kosovo. So this advancement in space technologies, as well as its use, such as space-based surveillance, communication, navigation, gave US an asymmetric benefit in the Gulf War. So the US, owing to its highly capable electro-optical and radar imaging satellite, was able to pinpoint the location of the enemy and therefore knew where and when to attack. So due to the extensive use of the space-based technologies in the Gulf War, the war is also known as the first space war. And this technological advancement by the developed space states such as the US and then USSR created geopolitical chain reaction. So the rivalry between US and China is superpower is well known in the international political corridors. And China often retaliates proportionally to compete in the rivalry. And the Sino-US Sino competition further reached new heights when China successfully conducted an anti-satellite test in 2007 and destroyed its uh, defunct satellite by using a kinetic warhead of SE-19. So this anti-satellite after three failed attempts, and this has happened, and the US actually responded next year by firing a standard avium as an anti-satellite to destroy one of its aging satellite. Russia has once again started, and this development of prototype laser weapon named as so-called Exilion in 2030, China announced that it is going to launch a suborbital rocket carrying a scientific payload to study the upper ionosphere. But this has been considered as a ploy to test a new ground-based anti-satellite system by the US. So Israel has also made operational its anti-ballistic missile having capability of exo-atmospheric interception. And even in 2019, 
China launched again a satellite using a Long March 11 rocket that lifted off from a floating launch pad in the LOC. So the advancements that are made by the China in the space technology cannot be solely held liable for creating ripples in the international political corridors. Because the US have always taken divergent stand when it comes to matters concerning space security. And this is quite evident from the stand of US and the leader of George W. Bush when the US wanted to enhance its power by placing offensive as well as uh, defensive weapons into the outer space. And even Donald Rumsfeld's Space Commission in 2001 recommended that ensure that the president will have the power to deploy weapons in the space. So after these recommendations, President Bush withdrew from the 30-year-old anti-ballistic missile treaty with the Russia that had actually banned the placement of weapons in the space. And it is also very important to note that the U.S. supports the discussion on the space and disarmament issue, but it is not willing to enter into any negotiations that pertains to space weaponry. And on the other hand, China had continuously proposed establishing of an international structure for prevention of space from weaponization over the past few years. And even very re uh, recently also, they have raised this issue in Newman. Uh, but America, uh, US never heeds to this, never. Because simultaneously, and uh, it, uh, China also simultaneously worked towards the development of space weapons. And China has actually ambitious plans when it comes to space exploration and also weaponization. Because on an average, China is undertaking 20 space program missions every year. The anti-satellite programs of China include signal jammers, experimental lasers, and land-based missiles, soft landing of a rover on the dark side of the moon, and this has already been achieved by China. And now it intends to have a habitable space station known as Tiangong-2 by 2022 and put astronauts on the moon. The further ambition includes Mars lander mission. And in 2015, China launched DAMP, which is considered to be the most capable dark matter explorer. And even in 2016, China launched Quest QESS, which is the world's first quantum communication satellite. So currently, China is engaged in the development of Long March 9 or Changzheng 9, which is a super heavy carrier rocket capable of carrying maximum payload capacity of 1,40,000 kilograms to that uh, low Earth orbit and even 50,000 kilograms to lunar transfer, or transfer orbit or 44,000 kilograms to the Mars. So the, this history shows that use of the space assets for advancing military agenda is not a novel concept. And the only novelty that one can see in the use of the space technology to jam as well as destroy the operational space assets of the other states. In fact, this has happened very recently by US the U.S. Space Force has received its first offensive weapons. And in fact, uh, Carl Grossman, he has shared one of his articles with me in which it states very clearly that uh, the first offensive weapons in the form of a satellite jammer known as a counter communication systems, Block 10.2, were delivered to the force in March. So the weapon does not destroy any enemy satellites, but can be used to interrupt enemy satellite communications and hinder enemy early warning systems meant to detect a US attack. In fact, this particular aspect can be even equated to many cyber warfare aspects as well. Here we can actually see how this warfare is changing its shape. And with, uh, with the tune, how US is actually investing, making its investments in the private sector, it can be even considered as its 
a capitalistic attitude, we can say. But here we can very clearly understand that the Kiwi American firm secured nearly 24.35 million US dollars from the US Air Force, new Space Force Division to develop the upper stage of its neutron rocket. And then the crew capable neutron, which will be able to lift an eight ton payload into orbit is due to launch in 2024. And then 24.35 million US dollars funding revealed overnight is part of a wider uh, like 87.5 million US dollars around to support new technology development programs by private space launch operators. So Space Force also awarded 24.35 million US dollars to Jeff Bezos, who owned Blue Origin, toward the development of its planned New Glenn heavy lifting rocket. And the same amount went to Boeing, Lockheed Martin, joint venture, United Launch Alliance, towards its pending Vulcan Center heavy lifting rocket. And even Elon Musk owned SpaceX received 14.47 million US dollars toward the development of its planned super heavy lifting Starship rocket. So, in fact, most of the times these nations, all these spacefaring nations are who are into these endeavors or ventures into this. They blame the other nations, saying that they are left with no other option except continue with their actions, like as a defensive mode, which is actually accepted by uh, laws of war and United Nations Charter. So in a statement to C4ISRnet, a Space War spokesperson said that General Raymond has stated many times that China and Russia have directed energy capabilities that are designed to damage or even destroy our satellites. So his response to this Congressman James Langevin's question was confirming that our architecture, these architecture developments in the face of these threats are appropriate. So now the question that arises for considering consideration is where does the quest for power in the new world order stops for the states? in the absence of international regime for regulation of the conduct of the states in the outer space. As uh, well mentioned by uh, Sandeepasa earlier, that Article 4 is uh, missing in many aspects, addressing these issues especially. So the militarization of space has not only created a sense of mistrust and suspicion in the states, but also severely prejudice the civilian infrastructure that is based and dependent on the satellites for navigation. As Bruce mentioned, one day it can become, the world would become dark, it would end up in dark, because once after anyone takes a one step ahead towards these actions, that's it. So all these satellites which are used for navigation and all those things which we have uh, just, I just mentioned a while ago. So in the light of the consequences of the weaponization and militarization, it becomes important that the states such as US, China, and Israel, which have either been abstaining from or vetoing the UN sponsored efforts, assume collective responsibility to comply with the existing framework such as outer space treaty, or endorse such treaties and convention, which ensure that weaponization of the space does not take place. In fact, these nations, these powerful nations, are creating a sense of insecurity in other space-faring nations. And these other nations, they are ending up investing in the same endeavors or creating these unnecessary uh, endeavors, or creating these uh, warheads or the anti-satellite missile, uh, just like India has tried this uh, mission of Shakti in 2019. And these things uh, should not be happening if we really want to 
have a sustainable uh, space in future. So it is up to the powerful nations to curtail their actions. At least now they realize the damage that's going to happen and work towards peace or involve themselves in such endeavors where the peace prevails. I always say that we can explore but not exploit. So we can explore. See, without exploring, today we may not have had these technological developments in place. So we are able to reap the fruits of this. So in order to reap more fruits, they should be following something in a very peaceful manner and allowing other states also have equal share in the profits. So it would be really appreciable if the space-faring nations realize the importance of keeping the space for peace and demilitarize the outer space in a hope of the same. And with this, I take leave now. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Thank you so much, Dr. Aruna Kamla. Um, thank you for taking out the time to be here with us. Um, now I shall move on and introduce Professor Shubhruto Goshroy, who is a research affiliate with the Program in Science, Technology and Society at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the USA. He is also a visiting professor at the Tokyo Institute of Technology, and he has spent two, almost two decades as an engineer in defense research before transitioning into policy after receiving the IEEE Congressional Fellowship. In fact, after doing so, he became a professional staff member of the US or United States Congress and uh, became a senior defense analyst at the United States Government Accountability Office, uh, which is the investigative arm of the Congress. His uh, research interests include um, military funding of research, nuclear weapons, nuclear disarmament, space weapons, etc. And lastly, he is also a co-chair of the International Network for Engineers and Scientists for Global Responsibility. Before yielding the floor to Ms. Uh, Professor Shubrudo, I would request everyone, all participants, to kindly turn on their videos so that we can take a screenshot while uh, Professor Shubrudo is speaking and uh, display it at our website or wherever we would like to publish. Thank you so much. Over to you, uh, Professor Shubhuto. Okay, uh, I will try to uh, screen share. I haven't done this before. Um, let's see. Can you see my slide? Not at the moment, sir. Okay. Um, uh, the, I press the uh, upward arrow next to the hand sign. Yes, uh, sir. That's the one, right? Um, yes. Okay. Uh, before that, you will have to uh, open the PPT first. Yes, I have I have that open on my screen. Let's see one second. Um, let's see. Uh, okay. Is it coming up? Not at the moment, so no. Okay. All right. Um, you, have click, you have to uh, click on the uh, on your PowerPoint after you've done all those other things. Oh, okay. Uh, uh, see here one more time. Okay. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, well, have you, have you actually uh, chosen between whether to share the entire screen or only the window? I think there should be a prompt uh, when you present screen thing. I think I ch I've chosen the sc full screen. Let's see again. Okay. Uh, should I then? Select window as okay. Uh, yeah, it would be better if you select the window and then click on the PPT, and, and you should be having the share option once you click on the PPT. Okay, um, it's uh, okay, I, and I have very poor eyesight, so anyway, I do not have uh, fancy uh, pictures to show, so I think I can just speak from my slides and I can make these slides available. Uh, uh, later on for. So um, the title of my talk is uh, U.S. Missile Defense and Space Policy Harmful to uh, Strategic Stability. And you have uh, one of the advantages and disadvantages at the same time of speaking um, as the, being the last speaker is that everything one wants to say has already been said. So it is both an advantage and a disadvantage. But anyway, I will focus on a 
relatively narrow part of the discussion about international space security in particular and global security in a broader scale and put the policy of the US government in perspective in all this, especially in the two very critical areas that affect uh, space, which is uh, uh, missile defense and weaponization of space. Uh, here, I'll be strictly discussing military space policy. Um, and uh, so let me set the stage. Um, as uh, the dominant superpower, US behaves with, the, with little regard to the accepted rules and norms of international affairs. In this regard, space is no exception. And then I will discuss the US approach to the current space law. I'm not a space law um, expert at all. I did work on some aspects when I was in Congress uh, on the staff of the uh, House International Relations Committee and the House Armed Services Committees, but th those are many years ago and um, uh, that's not my expertise. But I will do, I will refer to this uh, uh, in passing. And then I will critique uh, US policy on missile defense and space weapons. And finally, I will talk about um, our forthcoming report uh, of the um, International Network um, of engineers and scientists, of which I am a I am a co-chair, along with Professor Jurgen Schaffern, whose name uh, Dave mentioned regarding his talk at Darmstadt some time ago. Dave um, uh, and I uh, were um, um, members of this international group, um, and uh, <clears throat> and Dave did write uh, two very uh, important articles along along with uh, uh, Professor uh, Sheffern. Um, <clears throat> so my first slide would have said in the title is that US is a law unto itself. It helps create norms and rules and then breaks them at will when they no longer serves its interests. And examples are many. So I will give a few examples. Let's talk Let's say about the UN Charter that was mentioned by Rohit, I think, in the in his first introductory remarks, <clears throat> that UN Charter mentions, among others, uh, security in the space, preserving space. Eleanor Roosevelt was the wife of President <clears throat> Franklin Roosevelt, the famous US president during the war. And Eleanor Roosevelt, after the war, during the establishment of the United Nations, was the prime mover in setting up in, and the drafting of the UN Charter. And now we find US uh, violating the UN Charter in, in so many ways. Also, it doesn't recognize sovereignty of nations as in Syria, Iraq, or Afghanistan, as we have seen, or, or in the case of Kosovo and, the, and, and, the, and Siberia, I mean, um, uh, 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 sorry, I'm, I'm missing the country's name. Um, in, the capital is Belgrade. And um, invade countries without uh, UN approval under various subterfuges, such as um, humanitarian intervention to protect the unprotected, so to speak, uh, and extraterritorial killings by drone, as in the case of its own citizen, in, in Afghanistan and um, in Yemen and, uh, and also the Iranian general Soleimani. Another example is that of the International Criminal Court. International Criminal Court, which was established by the Rome Statute, uh, the Rome Treaty, US was a major player in drafting the treaty and ultimately did not sign the treaty saying that U.S. was concerned about its military personnel um, could be in jeopardy. Well, they have good reason for that, of course, given the track record of the U.S. military personnel starting in Vietnam. And uh, of course, we all know about 
Abu Ghraib and uh, <clears throat> Guantanamo. It also does not respect Geneva Convention, calling it if a fight against terrorism, which started with this uh, global war on terror, GWAT, uh, with, with the Bush administration and famous Rumsfeld as Secretary of Defense, that these are enemy combatants. Anybody is an enemy combatant. And, and we just saw the latest example of going after the so-called enemy combatants in Afghanistan when the drone attack killed 13 civilians, including several children. Finally, I mean, there are many examples. I'm, I'm only throwing out some of the things that come to my mind and they're major, is the economic sanction and blockades against countries like Iran, like Iraq previously, Venezuela, North Korea, of course, Cuba, the 60 year old embargo still continues and Syria. And then the final example is the US hypocrisy about the nuclear weapons. Now in nuclear weapons, all the emphasis from the United States is non-proliferation. It does not want other countries to acquire nuclear weapons yet it's now embarking on a 30 <clears throat> on a trillion dollar expansion of its own nuclear arsenal so these things just continue as us being a law unto itself and and as i talk about this greater um picture of us violating the rule of law as much as they talk about if you hear the U.S. Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, he talks on every turn about the rule of law. And it is laughable because it is, it is they who are violating the international rule of law at every turn. And space law is no exception. So U.S. operates on the premise, as far as space law is concerned, that there is no arms race in outer space. So no need for new laws. It doesn't agree with the notion that the current space law is inadequate, as we have heard from, from so eloquently from uh, Professor Bhatt and others, that it's inadequate, not only in Article 4, in, in general, the OST is, was, was, a, was a fantastic treaty at the time of its creation, 1967, is no longer given all the changes that we see in the space environment, and especially after the Cold War ended, and that it's inadequate to protect space from an arms race. And, and, and recall that the major space treaties, the starting with the Partial Test Ban Treaty, 1963, OST, 1967, the Moon Treaty, 1979, all of these were signed during early and middle of the Cold War superpower competition when there were only two major spacefaring nations competing, as Professor Bhatt has also mentioned. So for nearly two decades, there was nobody else until the European uh, satellites, uh, ESA, came on um, uh, in the picture and started launching some satellites also by the US at the time. And uh, so since Sputnik, there wasn't much of a competition uh, other than US and the Soviet Union. And now we have 80 countries that operate satellites and although only a few can launch them. And majority of UN member states believe that space law needs to be updated to account for the new reality, except US that is. US dismisses the notion of an impending arms race in outer space I just mentioned. So they make an argument that the UN Committee for the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space, COPIAS, which deals with the civilian aspects of the space programs, um, does not have the jurisdiction to talk about the problems of militarization of outer space. So you can shut off debate in COPIAS where large numbers of General Assembly members participate. And uh, OK, we're not going to talk about uh, security aspects because the security aspects, according to the US, should be taken up by the disarmament uh, part of the United Nations, which is 
the conference on disarmament and the first committee and so but what is the us doing there there us is blocking all even in consideration of the paros treaty draft that has been tabled by uh, the uh, by russia and uh, <clears throat> and and china for over two decades so it can't go anywhere so they have bottled up any discussion of um, uh, and they say well look ost is good enough we don't need and we know the limitations of the ost now aruna also passingly mentioned about the uh, anti ballistic uh, missile treaty since my topic is really missile defense and uh, so let me just quickly come to the abm treaty and uh, so 1972 anti ballistic missile treaty also known as the abm treaty was a landmark treaty that was signed by <clears throat> president uh, brezhnev and of all people the very conservative president of the united states uh, richard nixon it was signed in 1972 and its principal aim was to ban anti anti missile uh, otherwise known as missile defense so anti missile systems primarily for strategic missiles missiles meaning intercontinental ballistic missiles that have ranges of 5 to 6000 kilometers or more or miles or more so so this anti missile treaty uh, cre uh resulted in the arresting of the tremendous arms race that was going on with thousands and thousands at, at the height of the cold war in in that in those days the us and russia our uh, soviet union had over 60000 nuclear warhead and hundreds and hundreds of icbms and other missiles that uh, were were they were building at a very rapid rate so it it became clear that we have to arrest that but the other thing is that it brought by doing the uh, arms control it, it made arms control possible and many arms control treaties followed since the abm was signed and it brought strategic stability and the so but the other thing on the abm treaty its relation to space weapons is 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 important because the abm treaty also prohibited this is not much talked about at all uh also prohibited Base basing of weapons or even sensors. So you couldn't develop, you couldn't research, develop, test any space based sensors. Imagine that is why the people who are such supporters of uh, missile defense and space wanted to gut the ABM treaty. And I was in the Congress when these discussions were going on. And Russia at that time in 1990s, I was in Congress from 90. Five to ninety-eight, and it was um, just uh, in the middle of the Clinton administration, and uh, Boris Yeltsin was the president, and Russia was a very, very weak state of affairs. So the U.S. was really running roughshod, and I was in part of many of these deliberations because of my committee jurisdiction on this. And uh, so, an ABM treaty, they were trying to gut it and try to modify it, gut it, and then eventually, as soon as Bush came, they gutted it, and it's gone. So it was a landmark treaty. And, but it prohibited weaponization of space as well. So um, uh, <coughs> it, it, of course, as I said in the beginning, the US dismisses the notion of uh, the impending arms race in outer space. And militarization has really got to weaponization now that in the, particularly during the Trump administration with the creation of the Space Force and, and all of this, and um, uh, uh, that uh, they really wanted to go back to the days of the Star Wars, as uh, Aruna mentioned about the Star Wars. And, um, and so, and the, and the CDs totally blocked the Conference on Disarmament. And um, uh, it's, um, so we are now in, in, in this situation. So I'll quickly now, I know that we, we want to leave just a little bit time for people's Q and A, so I won't take any more time. We're, we're running short. So I will mention this. Um, and again, I will make my slides available. Um, just recently, uh, Dave and I were part of this uh, international uh, group of uh, scientists and academics that was set up by my organization and another disarmament organization called 
Abolition 2000, which uh, produced this report on um, ballistic missile defense and space weapons, opposing both of them. And, uh, and we are saying that this is a, a real and current danger. Um, I will quickly uh, just name the people who are members of our, our international working group. Uh, we had Christian Allward, professor, uh, not professor, uh, researcher, uh, Dr. Christian Allward, uh, Germany uh, in the Hamburg University, uh, myself, uh, Professor Masako Ikegami, uh, 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 Tokyo Institute of Technology professor in Japan, uh, Professor Klaus Montonen, uh, a PhD from Finland, Professor Jurgen Schaffron from Germany, uh, Dr. Dave Webb from the UK, and Monica Zappi, uh, biologist, uh, a scientist from Italy. Uh, other contributors were uh, uh, Professor Vladimir Kozin from Russia, uh, Professor Rajaram Nagappa from the National Institute of Advanced Studies in Bangalore, uh, Professor Gotz Noinek, uh, Hamburg University, and Professor Wei Zhang from Harvard University. So I was the coordinator and the, the editor of this report, and this report uh, we have recommended uh, um, uh, several steps and we we and the for the civil society to take up and 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 start organizing against i mean there's a lot of organization organizing that has gone on with the tpnw but um uh we really need to focus on missile defense and space weapons and so we urgently warn against a dangerous situation developing regarding those two things and we also strongly uh, recommend that uh, we ban all missile defense programs in Europe and cancel all the, the missile defense is still in a position where it can be tackled because it's it's still in relatively small uh, programs because as the programs grow, it's very difficult to, as Dave said, you, you want to take care of them when they are relatively small before many interests uh, take shape. And we have several other recommendations about uh, restoration of the uh, uh, Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, which I didn't have a chance to talk about. And um, and but the Japanese decision to not go forward with the uh, sea-based missile defense was a welcome decision. And uh, we also urge Japan to sign the TPNW. And uh, unfortunately, India's role in 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 overall in the international disarmament affairs has become pathetic. I mean, because of its calculation of siding with the United States, it has really given up the position it once had uh, in international affairs, especially of the UN, about peace, uh, nuclear weapons, and so forth. So I, I'm disappointed, but uh, our political situation is also in very difficult shape. Our meaning uh, India, although I am, I've been an American for a long time. But uh, okay, with that, I will stop. And about the uh, report, I will, um, uh, in my slide, the, uh, the website of information is there and uh, you can go and we will be releasing the report officially on uh, July, um, sorry, October, um, October 16th, Saturday, that is in Barcelona on a, on a Zoom program with a side event, uh, it's, it's possible uh, Professor uh, Webb will be there in Barcelona. If he is, then he will be able to participate in live. And we have a small uh, session to describe the report in detail and um, and highlight the different chapters and authors, etc. With that, I I thank you very much for the time and hope there are just a few minutes for some questions for other people. Yes, of course. Sir. Um, thank you so much for your time, and we'll definitely share the sl uh, slides with everyone, every participant here. Uh, we'll briefly uh, go over. I see that there have been a lot of discussion, and Professor Bruce has been very active in the chat box in terms of answering some questions. So, um, anyone, any part, any of the participants, or anyone has any comments or questions uh, that they would like to bring up to any of our presenters, uh, kindly do so. And if you can, please also uh, try to keep your video on so it is more engaging and uh, this sort of a personal touch to it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Before actually. Uh, uh, the other participants can actually step in and uh, ask the questions. I think there are a few questions which I saw in the chat box uh, to which uh, Professor Bruce has already uh, answered and even uh, 
Dr. Aruna has also been uh, responding there quite frequently. A uh, few of them, let me just uh, take, I have just noted down a couple of them. I think probably there was a question with respect to uh, passivation, uh, passivation of the satellites. So does it help in any uh, way for the purpose of uh, preventing the debris creation? It's a very, very interesting uh, the question. In fact, actually, uh, a lot of plans were made for the purpose of actually taking out the left out energy in the satellite or maybe the rocket so that it doesn't uh, explode or it doesn't create actually uh, the, the debris. Uh, but uh, all these efforts have not been very successful. They have been of very, very limited success. And even in the recent past, 2018 and 2019, uh, three of such satellites which have been passivated, they, they have exploded. 2018 and 2019, they have exploded. So the port, that has always actually raised the fingers with respect to the success of uh, the passivation. Then apart from that, one more important thing is that the passivation only helps in terms of taking the left out the fuel or energy, but it doesn't help in any way with respect to collision, the possibility of actually collision resulting in the cascade effect or the so spreading out of more and more debris that is not being actually prevented by the process of passivation. So it is a very limited success and only states like the United States are trying to uh, do it in a, uh, I mean, in a very, very limited uh, way. Uh, then there was an interesting question about the 5G. Uh, I think I should say it's a kind of a debate between actually one of the participants and then uh, uh, Bruce. So Bruce was responding to actually the 5G. Uh, so, uh, I mean, to my understanding, what is important for us to understand here is the sustainable development. Yes, we need, we need 5G, there is no doubt in terms of that for the purpose of connectivity in different uh, parts of the world. That may be one-sided argument, but at the same point of time, we're also concerned about actually say privacy, security, so on and so forth. So where does the sustainability lie? That's the mood question. And probably on the basis of that, we have to decide whether we have to go for 5G or whether actually there's a requirement or some kind of a restriction, all those different kind of uh, questions at the top of uh, out of place. Finally, there was also another very basic question on international law. That's on the treaty enforcement. Treaty enforcement. Yes, I do agree that actually the international law has got some limitation in terms of enforcement. But we should not compare the international law with the domestic law. Because domestic law has got a very long history when compared to the, the international law. And it has got a strong enforcement system. Because see, people can be imprisoned or maybe actually they can be fined. Some kind of a deterrence may be there. But whereas the treaty enforcement is concerned, it becomes extremely difficult when a developed country or a country having a greater bargaining power acts chaotically. In that circumstance, it becomes very difficult to actually bring them to book and ask them to comply with the treaty obligations. That has happened actually uh, in many fields, not just in space law, for example, in law of the sea also. Almost all the, the part of the world has become part of the UNCLOS, UN Convention on Law of the Sea. In United States, we could not actually pressurize them to become party to the, the, the UNCLOS. So same kind of a situation we evidence in many other fields uh, as well. And outer space law is not an exception. Uh, and in outer space, despite being the party to the four of the five space treaties, uh, of course, the United States is definitely not adhering to its uh, obligations under the outer space treaty. Maybe, uh, as rightly pointed out uh, in the responses by the, the speaker, uh, we have to actually make a collective effort. That's the only thing which is possible from our side. If, say, the United States says that, no, we are not going to recognize all these things, what should be the answer? That is an open-ended question. We don't have any answer for that. I just want to add one thing to what you said, Sandeep sir. Uh, and the best example is the Iraq war by US. That is the uh, best example. Of course, yeah, because uh, despite the fact that there was no Security Council sanction, the United States has in yes. intervened in many uh, places, not just in yes. Iraq. Even Afghanistan also, it was a later uh, sanction with the Security Council. Exactly. They proceeded first and then they uh, went for a sanction in the Security Council. And later, the committee could not find even any mass destruction weapons as well yes, they have Absolutely. given as an excuse right. Right. Yes. yeah exactly yeah yeah so if uh, any other participant is having any question please you can feel free to actually ask those uh, the questions i'll just make a comment about the <clears throat> u.s uh action uh, in that it is such a, a 
self-defeating action, even though U.S. is, of course, the dominant world power, that uh, <clears throat> it, despite the fact it is becoming perhaps more multilateral um, world with the China's rise and um, India and, um, <clears throat> and more resurgence of, of Russia, um, at the same time, in the case of space, U.S. also has the largest number of so-called space assets, satellites and other things. So if there is a problem in space that is some kind of a kinetic a collision or something, who is going to be the biggest loser? The biggest loser is going to be the United States. So it is really in the U.N. interest. And I had chaired a panel, this is in 2004, on, on space security for the United States with the very uh, well-known people, um, uh, space experts and non-space experts. And it was quite clear that satellites in general are vulnerable. We know that. And it was realized from the very dawn of the space age why the Soviet Union and the United States had bilateral agreement not to touch each other satellites. This. This was very much uh, a, 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 an agreement that stayed because all we said at that time was that the satellites at that time, primarily in the 60s, were called the national technical means of each country, which is they were used to monitor the sites of each country's or the other countries by each country, the other country's nuclear weapon sites. So it's a very important activities in the silos of the ICBMs, et cetera, et cetera. So, but we also know how vulnerable satellites are. I mean, any country with a missile cap capability that can launch a missile uh, uh, of some range, North Korea, Iran, whatever, we can take down a, a lot of these satellites that are in Leo, in the, in the low Earth orbit, very easily. And China has demonstrated, India has demonstrated. So it's really very, very puzzling why the U.S. policymakers don't realize this situation and make it so bad that if you don't follow the law, then you cannot ask other people to do the same. And, and, and you'll be the suffering the most because we are also the most dependent in the United States on satellite. Thank you so much for that insight. So um, while we wait for, an, uh, for a series of questions, uh, I'd like to take some personal advantage from this having this beautiful panel before me. So for a uh, for a research project, I was actually asked to answer the question of whether the establishment of the United States Space Force is ipso facto an act of aggression or something that can be seen as the threat to use of force. And I would love to have any opinions on the matter um, because I personally did not find any sort of legal uh, way to argue the same because of course, there is no act directed towards a, a particular country or there is no expression of the use of weaponry against another country. And it is merely political narrative. So if any of the panelists have any opinions, I would love to hear from you. I, I abstain from commenting since I'm your teacher. <laughs> yes, of course. Sir. Could you please repeat the question once again? Yes, ma'am. Um, so the question is whether the establishment of the United States Space Force is by in itself an act can be seen as an act of aggression or a threat to use force against any other country in that. Is it unlawful in itself to establish a space force at the uh, present time? OK, when the of the space treaty. Is explicitly mentioning that it can be used only for peaceful purposes how can us have a space force basing on what it can have done how can it take such a decision to have and because it is a powerful nation and there is no one to raise hand or to ask any question or explanation from this nation it is doing everything according to its own whims and fancies that has to be you know, this issue has to be raised by the international community. In fact, Bruce, do you have anything to say on this? Yeah, at the time that the Space Force was created during Donald Trump's administration, the language that was used 
was that the United States, with this new Space Force, would dominate space. That, that was the language Trump used. And it's important to remember that at that moment, the Democrats, Trump is a Republican, right? The Democrats controlled the House of Representatives. They could have stopped Space Force in the House of Representatives. They controlled the House. They didn't. The only thing the Democrats asked was to change the name to uh, Space Corps, like the Marine Corps. That was all. That was all they wanted. So that indicated to me that both parties, Republicans and Democrats, are lockstep in their desire to control and dominate space. Now, the point about uh, the space debris and and don't the Sobrata race don't doesn't the United States understand, you know, that it's fouling its own nest? It's it's uh, you know creating a problem for itself by all of this aggressive military activity. I think the answer is one of spiritual disconnection. The Native American, the indigenous people in this country have long been saying that when the white man came to America, they noticed that he was blinded by his love for the green frog skin, the dollar bill. He couldn't see beyond his desire for money and power he couldn't see his connection, his spiritual connection, his earthly connection to this planet. And I think that's ultimately a huge part of the answer. There is a deep spiritual disconnection in the minds and hearts of these militarists that run our country. And I have to go back also to that Operation Paperclip at the end of World War II when the Nazis were brought to this country, 1,500 of them, every part of the military industrial complex, they were placed in each various department. And so you have to ask the question, was there an ideological contamination when they, when they came to America? Did the Nazi ethic, Deutschland über alles, Germany overall, what is the difference between that? And the U.S.'s slogan, Master of Space. I'll just add one more thing to that on, uh, uh, um, on this issue of the congressional politics, uh, having been there on the <clears throat> Armed Services Committee and so forth. Yes, I mean, this business of Space Force, as um, uh, your research question um, uh, uh, po pointed out, probably our, our answer that it was, of course, more at this time, more of a politics to establish a foothold uh, that in future we can expand programs under this rubric, you know, creating a new service, which means new bureaucracy, more money, so et cetera, et cetera, because this is also a, a bureaucratic fight. But on the other hand, the Ronald, I mean, sorry, Donald Trump administration saw the resurgence of the Star Wars program because un, he, he was, of course, not very knowledgeable about these things, and he was just letting these people like John Bolton and Elliot Abrams and all these people take over the administration and, and run their thing. So they created quickly the Space Force because they wanted to have also a space-based experiment. Michael Griffin, who was the director of technology in the SDIO, Strategic Defense Initiative Program, which is the Star Wars, back in, in the 80s, also became the Under Secretary of Defense for testing uh, and, and logistics under the Reagan, I mean, the Trump administration. 30 years later, he came back to the Pentagon to head up this division. And he said, by 19, 2023, we will have a space based experiment. So they were so eager to change facts in the space, like changing facts on the ground to get a foothold. So make a, sp a space force, make a space-based experiment, and all these uh, a, a very right-wing ideology-driven driven decisions. That's why 
the, these things happen. And it doesn't have a lot of support in throughout the armed services, but they were running almost as a rogue kind of a, an entity within the system. Can I, could I just add something quickly? Uh, yes. Because the problem I think is that once one nation has done this, especially a dominant nation like the United States, that is create a space force and, and claim to be wishing to dominate that and, and also to point out that it's the next war fighting domain. I think as uh, Aruna has said, this goes totally against the, the Outer Space Treaty, but other nations are, are following. The UK, for example, launches its own Space Force, although it's called Space Command. And when that was launched, there was a statement made by the Secretary of Defense to say, today we show the sky is no longer the limit for our armed forces. So that kind of language and those kind of comments are being followed on by other nations and uh, others are picking this up too. So uh, it kind of escalating and, and um, what we really need to do is to, for more nations to speak out against this very loudly to say that this is not the way for the human race to, to progress. Uh, we must have more peaceful and cooperative junk, um, ventures, not, not uh, competitive and, law, um, and war fight, fighting ones. Thank you so much for those insights. Um, I'll yield the floor to any other questions that we have. And uh, yes, of course, ma'am. I'll yield the floor to any uh, for any other questions that we have. And if not, we'll move on to the vote of thanks. Right. All right. So. Um, I believe I, uh, I believe we can now yield the floor for the word of thanks. So, uh, Shavik sir, I uh, invite you to please give the word of thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Rohit. It, uh, I would uh, like to begin the word of thanks first of all by thanking all the participants who have patiently uh, uh, chosen to be here with us over these two hours over this insightful discussion and uh, and uh, and definitely our, our resource persons. Uh, Professor Gagnon, Professor Webb, Professor Camila, and uh, Professor Goshra, and especially I believe Professor Goshra and Professor Gagnon, this is, uh, they had to be quite a bit of an early riser uh, uh, in, in order to participate in this. I would also personally uh, like to comment upon the fact that this is one of the very few online and workshops that I have seen wherein the resource persons have uh, chosen to interact with the uh, participants uh, so much in such a positive fashion in the chat box, uh, answering patiently to all the questions. And so I would also like to uh, thank, of course, Professor Sandeep Bhatt, uh, without whose inspiration and leadership, this entire program and the entire center would not have been here. And uh, last but not the least, I would like to end with uh, thanking all the student members of the Center for Aviation Space Laws, uh, for Rohit Gupta, uh, who has has done a very good job in, in you know, conducting this entire program um, uh, uh, and all of the other members who have played their valuable roles like uh, Mr. Tushar Krishna, Mr. Shail Luhari, uh, Abha Shakar, uh, uh, Soumya Gupta and Anisha Mishra. Uh, and of course, we would like to uh, uh, thank everybody else uh, who have been, as I say, patiently with us and uh, made this entire thing a very successful one. I really look forward to other engagement with all of you uh, with similar programs in the days to come. Uh, so on behalf of uh, CASL and uh, NUJS, uh, we would like to thank you all and thereby conclude this program. Thank you. <laughs>